Good afternoon, everyone. The subcommittee will come to order. Uh, I uh, First of all, just some housekeeping uh, business that I need to take care of uh, since this is a remote hearing. Uh, I'd like to welcome the members uh, who are joining today's uh, remote hearing, uh, which I believe is just about everybody. Uh, members who are uh, joining uh, must be visible on screen for the purposes uh, of identity verification, uh, establishing and maintaining a quorum, uh, participating uh, in the proceeding and, uh, and, and voting. Those members must continue to use the software platform's video function while in attendance unless they experience uh, connectivity issues or other technical problems uh, that, uh, that render them unable uh, to participate on camera. Uh, if a member experiences technical difficulties, uh, they should contact the committee staff for assistance. Video of members' participation will be broadcast via the television uh, internet feeds. Members participating remotely must seek recognition verbally, and they are asked to mute their microphones when uh, they are not speaking. Members who are participating remotely are reminded to keep the software platform's video function on the entire time they attend the proceeding. Uh, members uh, may leave and rejoin the proceeding. If members depart for a short while uh, for reasons other than joining a different proceedings, uh, they should uh, leave the video function on. If members will uh, be absent uh, for a significant period or depart to join uh, a different proceeding, uh, they should exit the, the, uh, the software platform entirely and then rejoin uh, if they return. Members uh, may use the software platform's chat feature to communicate with staff regarding technical or logistical support issues uh, only. Finally, I've designated a committee staff member to, if necessary, uh, mute unrecognized members' microphones to cancel uh, any inadvertent background noise uh, they, uh, that uh, may disrupt the proceeding. So uh, with the, uh, the technical announcements out of the way, um, with that, I'm just gonna now uh, give my opening statement. Uh, first of all, I want to say welcome uh, to our uh, hearing today on the technology uh, and information uh, warfare, uh, the, the competition for influence and uh, the Department of Defense. I want to uh, thank Ranking Member Stefanik uh, for joining me uh, in holding uh, today's uh, to the, the hearing today. Uh, I'd also like to thank our witnesses for appearing today uh, to discuss uh, technology enabled information warfare. Uh, as a national security threat, we welcome Mr. Glenn uh, Gerswell, uh, Gerstel, I'm sorry, uh, Senior Advisor at uh, the Center for Strategic and International Studies, uh, and Ms. Nita uh, Jankowitz, uh, Disinformation Fellow at the Wilson Center, uh, and uh, to provide, over, uh, to provide uh, insight on the, on the Pentagon's information operations strategy and leadership, we are joined by uh, uh, Dr. Herb Lynn, Senior Research Scholar at Stanford University. And finally, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Joseph Joe Kirschbaum, um, the Director, Defense Capabilities and Management Team uh, at the uh, the Government Accountability Office. Uh, first of all, I want to say, Dr. Kirschbaum, uh, welcome back, and I want to thank you all uh, for appearing uh, today. This really uh, it's an honor to have you here, and, and truly, uh, it's an esteemed panel. So, uh, the United States uh, is challenged in the information environment daily. Uh, competitors like China, Russia, and violent extremist organizations uh, use uh, information warfare to achieve their objectives while uh, below the threshold uh, of armed conflict as they seek to avoid traditional U.S. military uh, advantages and uh, undermine uh, the, the free international order uh, and, uh, and democratic values. Um, the recently re released uh, annual threat assessment of the U.S. intelligence community makes clear that a variety of state and non-state actors weaponize information to undermine the United States by sowing discord among our citizens, influencing decision makers and uh, reversing what uh, we uh, what uh, had once been uh, a strength uh, of our nation's historical information advantage. So I often focus uh, on what lies ahead in defense, but it's worth noting that the United States and the military are facing momentous challenges uh, in the information environment right now, which can undermine the very fabric of our democracy. What makes, um, and, and, and what makes these uh, threats particularly powerful is that foreign adversaries uh, can target the US and allied citizens almost instantly without crossing physical boundaries or borders. These threats will only grow uh, as artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, and other technology uh, enabled information uh, operations uh, exponentially increase 
uh, the speed and the scope uh, of the danger. So according uh, to the, the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence, state adversaries uh, employing artificial intelligence enable disinformation attacks uh, to sow division in democracies and disrupt the public's sense of reality. Um, but uh, how to confront these national security challenges uh, is a difficult question. So I believe uh, the nation must respond forcefully to deter bad actors uh, in the information domain, uh, invest in robust U.S. public diplomacy, and educate the public and our service members about uh, these dangers. We must also articulate a vision for the information environment and delineate thresholds of behavior that will trigger a response. So uh, I was certainly encouraged when the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence recommended that the United States develop a new strategy to counter disinformation while investing in technology to counter artificial intelligence enabled information warfare. And I'm also looking forward to the insight our witnesses will provide uh, on how to address uh, these threats. Likewise, uh, we will explore how the Department of Defense is uh, organized to, uh, to compete in the information environment, including cyber, electromagnetic uh, spectrum, military information support operations, deceptions, and operational security. The military is challenged uh, in, the inf in the information environment by capable adversaries, make no mistake about it, and Department of Defense priorities must reflect this reality. The Pentagon has a critical role in, in protecting uh, the nation, our partners, and our allies from threats in the information environment and in advancing our national interests uh, in this sphere. Recognizing this, Congress and this, uh, this committee uh, have continuously pushed the department to prioritize adapting to the, um, the weaponized information environment, including uh, by creating the principal information uh, operations advisor. Yet, I'm concerned the department leadership has been slow to adopt uh, to adapt uh, to the changing to the changing nature of warfare in this domain. To give an example, in 2020, nine of the then 11 four-star combatant commanders wrote a memorandum asking for additional support for their information operations. They wrote, and I quote, we continue uh, to miss opportunities uh, to clarify truth, counter distortions, uh, puncture false narratives, and, uh, and influence uh, events uh, in time uh, to make a difference, close quote. I couldn't agree more. Uh, too often, uh, it, it appears the department's information-related capabilities are stovepipe centers of excellence uh, with varied management and leadership structures, which makes critical coordination more difficult. Further, the Pentagon has made uh, limited uh, progress uh, implementing the 2016 operations in the information environment strategy, which raises questions uh, about the department's information operations leadership structure. So with that, um, these are challenging questions uh, without easy answers. I know that. But uh, I hope my colleagues uh, will uh, take advantage of the impressive array of witnesses uh, that we have before us to get greater, greater clarity and uh, a uh, clearer path forward uh, uh, after this hearing. So with that, I'll now turn to Ranking Member Stefanik for her opening remarks. Please, you're recognized. Thank you, Chairman Langevin, and thank you to our witnesses for testifying today. Information warfare is one of the most complex and important missions undertaken by the Department of Defense, especially in the 21st century information age. From large scale conventional conflicts of the past to the modern day gray zone conflicts of today, information operations have been critical to shaping the operating environment and weakening our adversary's strategic position eroding the resilience of our target adversaries while also winning the hearts and minds remains the ultimate objective of information operations. As a former senior advisor to the Secretary of Defense, Robert Riley said, quote, ultimate victory comes when the enemy speaks your language and embraces your idea, end quote. Unfortunately, we know our adversaries are not embracing our ideas. Instead, China, Russia, Iran, and non-state actors alike are weaponizing information to undermine the United States and our interests, employing asymmetric information capabilities rather than engaging us in traditional military means. Therefore, we must be prepared to not just resist information operations and defend our interests, but also project our own capabilities to exploit and shape the information environment. 
Today's information and media ecosystem is significantly different than in the past, with exponential advancements in technology allowing words and ideas to spread faster and wider than ever before. In the last decade, we have seen how a short video, photo, or social media post can have a profound impact on the geopolitical landscape. Going forward, international competition, diplomacy, and military operations will be increasingly based on human-centric networks and patterns. Fortunately, our military and intelligence community recognize this, and both are adapting to this landscape and the information in which we live. Congress has given clear authorities to DOD to conduct information operations, and we expect the department to use those authorities effectively. As such, we can no longer just rely solely on our special operations forces to conduct these operations. This must be a comprehensive approach by the DOD, the services and combatant commands to ensure our messages are effective and achieving our objective to positively shape the operating environment. Two years ago, Congress required the department to conduct a re review of its information operation strategy. However, we are still awaiting this review and briefing. This subcommittee in particular, with jurisdiction over cyber and artificial intelligence, is uniquely suited to support the department's information operations. Yet without the proper review and information from DOD, it is difficult to appropriately support this priority. Congress has also created the position of the Principal Information Operations Advisor, so the department would have a single person overseeing military information support operations, our MISO efforts. Unfortunately, this position was layered below the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, contrary to congressional intent. This position was not created as another bureaucratic layer, but as an agile single role with the mandate to guide each service's efforts. We must also act on the recommendations from the AI Commission and invest in technologies to combat AI-enabled information threats, as well as increase core coordination with the State Department's Global Engagement Center to counter foreign propaganda targeted towards the United States. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses on how DOD can organize information operations to be more coherent, nimble, agile, and effective, and how the department and the IC can work together to enhance MISO efforts. Likewise, we must continue to discuss the critical defensive roles DOD can play to protect the information environment as our adversaries continue to wage a persistent information war on our interests abroad and our citizens here at home. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member Stefanik. Um, with that, um, uh, we'll now turn to um, uh, our witnesses uh, will now hear from Mr. Glenn Gerstall. Uh, Mr. Gerstall served as the National Security uh, Agency General Counsel from 2015 to 2020, is now a senior advisor at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, Mr. Gerstall, uh, you are now recognized uh, to summarize your testimony for five minutes, uh, and uh, uh, thank you for appearing today. Chairman Langevin, Ranking Member Stefanik, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today along with such distinguished experts. Over the past few months, social media platforms have been awash in falsehoods on political topics, ranging from election fraud to the Capitol insurrection to climate change and Antifa protesters. Even the seemingly nonpartisan sphere of public health has been politicized and damaged by cyber falsehoods about the efficacy of face masks and vac vaccinations. As a former national security official and a lawyer concerned with our civil liberties, I would offer three observations relevant to the subcommittee's work. First, perhaps the most pernicious aspect of the digital revolution, disinformation, intentionally misleading erroneous information, threatens our very democracy, leading to mistrust of institutions, cynicism about our leaders and skepticism about our ability to solve social problems. Second, the problem of foreign disinformation is almost surely going to get worse and will pose serious national security threats against which our military prowess will be largely ineffective. Third, while it may be difficult, there are indeed steps we can take to counter these threats. Returning to my first point, with three out of four Americans getting some or all of their news from social media platforms, 
disinformation could specifically affect our military in concerning ways. At the most basic level, the resulting cynicism or lack of trust in our military, as was revealed in the recent Reagan Institute survey, might well erode the national consensus underpinning congressional appropriations for weapon systems or veterans affairs, and more directly recruiting for our all volunteer military forces. Broader threats to our military arise from our foreign adversaries use of disinformation as a tool of their statecraft. For example, China's concerted online campaign to deflect investigations into the cause of the COVID-19 outbreak, to paint themselves as successful in curtailing the virus when Western democracies have been foundering, and to deny their militarization of the South China Sea, all complicate, if not undermine, our foreign relations and heighten the chance for conflict. The second point is that foreign cyber-propelled disinformation is likely to get much worse to the extent that we would have difficulty in fending off weaponized disinformation coming from a sophisticated foe. Indeed, the recent final report of the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence cited a, quote, gathering storm of foreign influence and interference, and asserted that our foreign foes will use artificial intelligence systems to enhance their disinformation campaigns, including by creating undetectable, undetectable deep fake videos and audio recordings. The resulting skepticism, treating official and counterfeit news sources equally, would yield a chaotic and unreliable reality in which truth and genuine information are elusive. The seemingly inexorable trajectory of ever worsening foreign cyber attacks from Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea shows us what online disinformation will look like from those adversaries. The same factors that shield them in cyber malevolence, the uncertainty of provable attribution, and the absence of directly caused actual injury or physical damage, will also work even more effectively to insulate them as they inevitably step up their disinformation campaigns. What if next time Russia or Iran seizes on a natural disaster, say a hurricane or flood, and weaponized the crisis with false information online about the hurricane's, hurricane's path or expected river crestings, or even wrong instructions about escape routes. We don't need to wait until such a crisis or disaster. The very fact that there are many sources contributing to disinformation means that we have multiple ways to stem it. I'd be happy to respond to your questions about specific solutions, but I'll concede that responding to the challenges of disinformation will not be easy, since it will require making difficult and controversial decisions about the responsibility of the private sector for our national well-being and about restrictions on speech. But it isn't impossible, and Congress, in concert with the private sector, should lead the way. Our national well-being depends on nothing less. Thank you for the opportunity to present my views to the subcommittee. Thank you very much, Mr. Gerstel. Um, again, thank you for your testimony, and uh, we appreciate having you here. Uh, we'll now receive testimony from uh, Ms. Nita Jankowitz. Uh, Ms. Jankowitz uh, is a, uh, a disinformation fellow uh, at the center. Uh, excuse me for a second. Um, it, it, uh, um, yeah, it's, um, Ms. Jankowitz is, is disinformation fellow at the Wilson Center uh, and is the author uh, of How uh, to uh, Lose the Information War Russia, fake news, and the future of conflict. Uh, Ms. Jankowitz, uh, thank you for being here. You are now recognized to summarize your testimony for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Langevin, Ranking Member Stefanik, distinguished members of the subcommittee. It's an honor to testify before you today. I'm the daughter of a veteran. My father, an aerial reconnaissance officer in Vietnam, died in 2010 from complications from multiple myeloma, which he contracted as a result of his exposure to Agent Orange during his service. I know he would be thrilled to see me testifying before you today in the service of truth. I've spent my career on the front lines of the information war. We all now seem to recognize that the threat exists. But as I told your colleagues on the Appropriations Committee in 2019, the United States has been a tardy, timid, or tertiary player stymied by domestic politicization. Unfortunately, nearly two years later, we are in the same place. So it bears repeating. Disinformation is not a partisan issue. As we witnessed throughout the COVID-19 pandemic and on January 6th, 
It affects public health, safety, and our democratic process. It is crucial that Congress understand this. Otherwise, we remain vulnerable. How did we get here? In part, we haven't understood the scope of the problem. The US thinks of disinformation as a string of one-off occurrences that warrant attention only in the moment. We haven't created a comprehensive long-term defense plan, and there's too little recognition of the need to shore up domestic vulnerabilities. Russia, China, and other authoritarian states know how to exploit this. They take advantage of American inaction, engaging in perpetual information competition, which has three characteristics. First, adversaries understand information competition is the new normal, and they are constantly probing for societal fissures to exploit. We've seen this with conspiracy theories about the origins of COVID-19 and the efficacies of Western vaccines. And Russia, of course, has an ongoing campaign to exacerbate racial tensions in the US. Second, they use all channels available, government and non-government, online and offline. China, for example, uses a wide range of state bodies, not just traditional national security bodies, to influence Western opinions about protests in Hong Kong, and more recently, to paint a positive picture of life in Xinjiang. Third and finally, they use perpetual information competition to target alliances and international organizations. For instance, Russia waged a campaign to prevent Ukraine from signing an association agreement with the European Union in 2016. In short, hostile state information operations increase domestic tension and decrease American resilience. To meet the challenge of perpetual information competition, the Department of Defense should organize itself around a posture of enduring information vigilance, a concept I developed with my colleague in the UK Cabinet Office, Henry Collis. It's composed of the three C's. The first is capability. We should remember the old military adage, don't operate the equipment, equip the operator. The DOD workforce should be able to proactively monitor and identify informational vulnerabilities. Section 589E of the 2021 NDAA, which trains active duty personnel, their families, and civilian DOD employees in detecting information operations is an excellent starting point. Such a training program could also be rolled out to all civil servants across the federal government. The second C is interagency coordination. DOD and the wider USG must break out of our siloed national security thinking. To remedy this, the National Security Commission on AI recommends the creation of a joint interagency task force to coordinate intelligence and information sharing around IO. I agree that the federal government requires a central node for monitoring disinformation and coordinating policy, ideally in the White House. But my research across Europe suggests we also need the involvement of non-traditional security departments. In the long term, the key to combating disinformation lies with departments focusing on education, arts, and health at federal and local levels, as well as building a thriving pluralistic media environment and teaching civics. The third C is international cooperation. This includes better sharing of information to identify threats and a formulation of effective responses with allies. Toward this goal, the NSCAI suggests an international task force led by the Global Engagement Center at the State Department. However, the GEC's remit is too large, its budget too small, and its reputation within the interagency and international communities too uncertain to add such a task to its portfolio. It currently produces open source intelligence analysis in addition to its coordination, policymaking, and uh, analytic roles. And I recommend that intelligence gathering re rest with analytic, not policy bodies. The GEC's limited resources are better allocated in coordinating with embassies and other agencies in establishing and implementing policy and program priorities. Finally, while the idea of a task force for international coordination is a noble one, the US must recognize that we are arriving late to this party. We should augment efforts that are already underway by close allies, such as the UK's International Partnership for Countering State-Sponsored Disinformation and the G7 Rapid Response Mechanism. Enduring information vigilance cannot be built overnight. It requires a long-term commitment that will likely outlast the current political class but the result will be a more resilient society. The United States must act not only as the staunchest defender and guarantor of democratic values among our allies abroad, but actively lead by example, underlining that disinformation knows no political party, 
and that America is committed to reversing the normalization of disinformation in our own political discourse. Once again, thank you for this opportunity and I look forward to your questions. Very good, thank you, Ms. Jankowitz. Um, we will now receive testimony from uh, Dr. Herb Lynn. Dr. Lynn studies uh, cyber policy, information warfare, and influence operations and is a senior research scholar at Stanford University. Uh, he is the author of Bites, Bombs, and Spies. Dr. Lynn, you are now recognized to summarize your testimony for five minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Langevin, Franking Minority, uh, Member Stefanik, and uh, distinguished members. Uh, thank you for inviting me to testify today. I'm speaking for myself today and not on behalf of any institution. The general thrust of my remarks is that the Department of Defense is poorly structured and equipped to cope with the information warfare threat facing the U.S. as a whole. Uh, however, the DOD can make a meaningful contribution in addressing part of the problem. We usually believe in a clear distinction between peace and war. Today, we are not in a shooting war with Russia or China, but we're not at peace either. Our adversaries prosecute the state of not peace in many ways, including cyber-enabled information warfare. Such warfare presents several new challenges. First, the Constitution is the foundation of the US, of US government. Deeply embedded into the Constitution is the concept of a marketplace of ideas. Here, ideas publicly compete with each other, and truth emerges from public debate of ideas without government interference. But this concept emerged at a time when information was hard to obtain. Today, the internet and social media have brought a deluge of information so great that no one can possibly access or process all of the information needed to evaluate any given idea. The second challenge is that the information marketplace presumes that people process information rationally, thoughtfully, and deliberately. However, psychological science has demonstrated that people often do not do so. Instead, they often make fast, intuitive judgments based on how they feel from their gut, even though everyone is, in fact, capable of uh, thoughtful deliberation. Such judgments, the fast, intuitive judgments from the gut, are usually adequate for the kinds of personal decisions found in everyday life. But they are inadequate when the consequences are, are for error uh, are, are high. Moreover, many of our tech companies have learned that supplying content that plays to our worst habits of non-rational thought is the way to increase user engagement, which in turn increases their profitability. Third, the boundaries between foreign and domestic sources of information chaos are blurry. Russians and Americans may not be working side by side to sow disorder, mistrust, and polarization in the United States, but the scope, nature, and effect of, these, of their activities, even if separately conducted, are largely indistinguishable. That means any effective effort against Russian activities will inevitably have collateral effects against American activities that are similarly oriented. In sum, the information warfare threat to the United States is different than from past threats and has the potential to destroy reason and reality as the basis for societal discourse, replacing them with rage and fantasy. Perpetual civil war, Political extremism waged in the information sphere and egged on by our adversaries is every bit as much of an existential threat to American civilization and democracy as any military threat imaginable. Why can't DOD defend effectively against the, the information warfare threat? Fundamentally, it's because the information warfare threat requires a whole society response and DOD cannot and is not in a position to orchestrate such a response. More specifically, DOD policy directives prohibit information operations directed at U.S. audiences, regardless of the intent underlying them. And that includes activities intended to protect U.S. audiences against foreign information warfare operations. But there are also cultural constraints. DOD culture is oriented towards defense against physical threats, planes, missiles, and the like. But DOD was never designed to defend against non-physical threats. Joint doctrine does not even acknowledge the possibility that the U.S. armed forces could be the target of adversary psychological operations. Nevertheless, despite existing policy and culture, DOD is well positioned to address the information warfare threat for at least one segment of the U.S. government, namely the armed forces and their families. Every member of the U.S. military swears an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. But they the vast majority receive no education, no instruction on what these words mean. The FY 2021 Defense Authorization Act called attention to the need to protect U.S. military personnel and their families from foreign malign influence and disinformation campaign. That was the previously mentioned Section 589 
uh, E. Uh, and both Secretary Austin and the Congress uh, have expressed concerns about extremism in the U.S. military. This is facilitated by exposure to foreign disinformation campaigns. These points suggest the need for DOD to provide substantial in-house training for military personnel on the meaning of their oaths and on civics education as a prerequisite foundation for such training. That concludes the oral uh, portion of my testimony. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Lin. Appreciate you being here as well. Uh, we will now receive testimony from uh, Dr. Joe Kirschbaum. Uh, Dr. Kirschbaum, welcome back. And, uh, and thank you uh, and your team uh, for all the, uh, the, the recent support. Uh, Dr. Kirschbaum is the director of the Government Accountability Office Defense Capabilities uh, and Management uh, Team. Uh, Dr. Kirschbaum, uh, you are now recognized to summarize your testimony for five minutes. Chairman Langevin, Ranking Member Stefanik, and members of the subcommittee, I'm pleased to be here today to discuss the vital role of the Department of Defense's operations in the information environment. Throughout history, militaries and states have sought advantage through actions intended to affect the perception and behavior of adversaries. As we noted today, our adversaries, particularly China and Russia, are taking advantage of emerging information technology to offset the United States' conventional warfighting advantages. Although we focused on the Department of Defense, uh, to reiterate, as an element of U.S. national power, information operations as a whole are necessarily part of a whole of government and whole of society effort. My testimony today describes the Department of Defense's information operations concepts and uh, DOD's actions to implement the 2016 strategy and address information operations challenges. This statement is based on reports we issued in late 2019 and our assessment of defense information related documents. The terms for information operations, doctrinal terms, are many and varied. DOD has defined some, but inconsistency and potential confusion remains. Among the things the department is actually working on right now is a more consistent set of information operations related terms. To achieve greater effects in the information environment, Combatant commanders can plan and execute operations that combine multiple information-related capabilities. Such capabilities include military information support operations, uh, what was traditionally known as psychological warfare, uh, military deception, cyberspace operations, electromagnetic warfare, um, operation security, and special technical operations. There are, however, many other related capabilities, uh, such as public affairs, civil military operations, uh, and intelligence capabilities. A good example of an information operation uh, is the effort by the Allies in 1944 to convince the Germans that the attack on occupied Western Europe would come at a place other than the actual target of Normandy. Operation Fortitude involved a number of what we would now call information-related capabilities. These included creation of fictitious military units with all the requisite paperwork, uh, associated radio transmissions and traffic, uh, and assigning a real U.S. Army general, in this case, George S. Patton, to command those units. It also involved the creation of mock aircraft and landing craft located in Southeast England and many other intelligence and military deception techniques. While this is on a grand scale, uh, defense planners today can do the same kinds of things to integrate more than one information-related capability to achieve desired end states. DOD's 2016 strategy for operations in the information environment was intended to significantly enhance their ability to conduct information operations today. However, the department did not fully implement that strategy, leaving approximately 80% of the enumerated tasks incomplete. Among the largest omissions was the absence of an implementation plan or an investment framework. The department instead shifted focus to develop a joint concept of operations and a capabilities-based assessment, both worthy efforts. It then started to develop a new strategy, which remains in development. We also found gaps in DOD's leadership, oversight, and management. The department assigned most responsibilities to the Under Secretary of Defense for policy, However, delegating many of those responsibilities down to a lower level and failing to formalize authorities exacerbated the dispersal of leadership and focus. As you pointed out, Mr. Chairman, congressional direction has prompted movement in the department. 
in fact, most movement. Examples include the new information operations cross-functional team, which may mitigate some of the problems we identified, and designation of the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy as the principal information operations advisor reporting directly to the Secretary of Defense. Ultimately, however, the leadership the principal advisor exercises and the support the department gives them in implementing department-wide strategy and vision will be critical. DOD has integrated information-related capabilities in some military operations, but has not addressed key planning, coordination, and operational challenges. This is important for ensuring that DOD integrates the information dimension into routine operational planning. DOD resisted our recommendation to conduct a comprehensive posture review in order to assess challenges. However, once again, Congress subsequently required the Secretary of Defense to conduct such a posture review. DOD told us they've taken initial steps to conduct this review, but did not provide an estimated completion date. In summary, there are opportunities for improved DOD leadership, recognition of information as a joint function, and better preparing the military to conduct information operations and counter our adversaries. I look forward to continuing to work with this committee and the department to help it address these challenges and make the most of these opportunities. Chairman Langevin, Ranking Member Stefanik, and members of the subcommittee, this completes my prepared statement. I am happy to respond to any questions. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Kirschbaum. And I want to thank all of our witnesses for your testimony today. Uh, it, it, um, you do a great service uh, to the subcommittee and to the committee as a whole uh, much by, by appearing today and giving you your perspective. Dr. Kirschbaum, let me start with you. Um, so Congress has consistently encouraged uh, the Pentagon to focus on these issues, including requiring the DOD to create a uh, principal information operations advisor. Has the Pentagon sufficiently elevated uh, dedicated information operations leadership? Mr. Chairman, I would say yes and no. So the, the, in, in brief, the, what's happened with the diffusion of leadership, uh, for example, most of the responsibilities for information operations was delegated down to the level of the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Special Operations and Combating Terrorism. As that title indicates, that's a lot to work on. And, to, and, and so incorporating information operations into that very small staff has generated issues where while very capable, they don't have, they're not at the right level in a, in a lot of cases to achieve some of the results because of that, that lack of leadership. Now, the department has gone back and identified the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy as the principal information operations advisor in the hopes that keeping it at that level will, will elevate importance. And the comparison, of course, is made to the situation with the principal cyber advisor. Um, there are some differences that we're a little concerned about seeing how the department carries through with that. For example, um, the principal cyber advisor had a deputy who could leverage a deputy assistant secretary who was focused solely on cyber operations. The Undersecretary Defense for Policy, uh, as, you, as you appreciate, is doing just a few things. So focusing on information operations will be important to see what, what level of resources, what level of attention it gets, uh, assuming it's at that right level, assuming they're able to assign a, a deputy um, with the right focus, and then follow through with the right um, structural, procedural uh, impetus in order to make sure momentum continues. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. Uh, Mr. Gerstow, um, can you further explore uh, uh, why foreign enabled mine influence and disinformation are a national security threat and uh, how will emerging technologies like artificial intelligence increase this threat? Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so I think we have rich evidence of the fact that foreign inspired uh, disinformation is a real nas national security threat. Um, the, uh, the 2016 elections were a, certainly a good example of that with, uh, as you know, the Senate uh, Intelligence Committee issued a five volume bipartisan report finding that Russia uh, actively intervened in our uh, elections uh, in an effort to influence them in 2016. Um, it's hard to say for sure exactly what the result would be, but anybody would think that tampering with our democratic process must, must by definition be a national security issue. Um, we've certainly seen how foreign disinformation from China and Russia, which just this week, once again, was touting the virtues of their Sputnik vaccine 
and degrading and, uh, the virtues and qualities of the American Pfizer and other COVID vaccines. Clearly disinformation that's going to hurt our public health, the ability of, of Americans to get vaccinated. Again, another effect on national security. If we want a very specific example, just quickly, back in uh, last uh, September, when there were terrible wildfires in, uh, in Oregon in the Northwest, um, Russia jumped on uh, a couple of uh, misleading and false statements uh, that were set forth in some QAnon accounts and really weaponized them. It, they, in a concerted, coherent way, amplified them and turned them into a, a detailed, rich story uh, of falsehoods about who started the the, fi uh, the uh, wildfires uh, claiming that Antifa protesters were doing it. It reached a point because of what Russia was doing that civilians actually set up roadblocks in Oregon in an effort to stop uh, these perceived but erroneous uh, protesters who of course weren't there. It actually hurt people who were trying to flee the fire so much so that the Douglas County Sheriff and the FBI pleaded with the public to stop circulating these falsehoods. So we've seen how foreigners can take an existing division and create national security problems here on our soil. It stands to reason, following your other question, uh, Mr. Chairman, that using technology, artificial intelligence, to micro-target uh, viewers and listeners will only exacerbate the problem. So that is, that is why I said, uh, I believe the problem has the potential for getting worse before it gets better. And from your vantage point, what can the United States do to protect uh, itself from both a technological and policy standpoint? I think there are a wide range of tools. Uh, as I said in my earlier comment, and I know the other panelists agree with me here, um, disinformation has many causes. So the fact that it has many causes means that we also have many ways of treating it, to use a sort of a medical analogy. Uh, this is a chronic condition, a complex chronic condition. So uh, it's not a disease with, that will be cured by one miracle drug. So I think we have uh, a rich opportunity to use a range of legal tools at our disposal, perhaps by tightening up Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, perhaps by either causing the industry to self-regulate or to regulate the ability of social media platforms to limit the virality of, of falsehoods, to, to check them before they get spread too widely. Um, we can take steps uh, in our society to increase, uh, as others have said, uh, digital literacy, civic education, so that um, people will have a better understanding and, and will better be better able to uh, assess uh, falsehoods. Um, I think the most important thing, and I'm echoing what, what uh, Ms. Jankowicz just said, and, and you, Mr. Chairman, also, uh, is we need an integrated approach to this. Russia and China use an integrated approach, a whole of government and their private sector, to create these disinformation campaigns. There's an asymmetry. We don't. We need to do that, and that will be the key to success in this area. You know, very insightful, well said, and I couldn't agree more. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, my time's expired. I'm going to uh, now turn to Ranking Member Stefanik for her questions. Thank you. My question is for Dr. Lin. Uh, in the past, the special operations community and service members in the field of PSYOPs and civil affairs had the most experience with information operations. It is going to be very important that the department scale these skills to a wider force. How do we do that? And specifically, how do we equip our cyber forces with the skills to conduct effective information operations? Mr. Lin, you're on mute still. All right, thank you, um, Ranking uh, Minority Member. Uh, Stefanik, thank you for asking the, the question. Um, I hate technology. <laughs> um, the, the, uh, how do we get the cyber forces to, to be uh, better able to uh, address uh, the um, influence operations uh, side of the house? Um, that is a question. I addressed that in the paper that I submitted uh, for the, the record on uh, dysfunction uh, in, in the DOD about uh, doctrine and, and so on. Uh, the short answer is, is, is that uh, I, I believe that there needs to be a um, joint, something that's joint and standing, some effort, some entity. 
uh, that pulls together the cyber people together and the uh, uh, and, and the psyops people uh, uh, together as equals. Um, cyber command has the expertise uh, in, uh, the, in in the information delivery side of the house. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the PSYOPs people, uh, the MISO people have the uh, responsibility of understanding content uh, and those two have to be put together. Uh, gr trying to grow, for me, trying to grow um, psychological expertise out of what are fundamentally a bunch of, of technical hackers, as good as they are, that's not their skill set. Uh, their their skill set is is, is uh, flipping bits uh, and, and and so on. Um, I speak as a as a former bit flipper myself, um, and, and uh, getting the psychological insights from others who are much more expert in that I think is the way to go. So there has to be a standing team, uh, and the standing part is really important uh, because it recognizes the fact that this is an ongoing problem, not a not one of uh, a specific campaign here or there. Yield back. It did. Thank you. Yield back. Thank you very much, uh, Ranking Member Stefanik. Uh, Mr. Keating is now recognized for five minutes. Is Mr. Keating still with us? If so, well, you might be on mute. Okay. Um, uh, if Mr. Keating is not there, uh, in the tradition of going Democrat, Republican, I'll just go down the uh, the list uh, to Mr. Morelli. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. This is uh, really a, a fascinating subject, and uh, I, I, I'm new to the committee and the subcommittee, so I'm not uh, entirely familiar with uh, DOD's actions, but I, 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 having listened now, and I, I hear that there's calls for more coordination, uh, more information sharing, greater intentionality of our focus, but I'm still struggling just as a lay person to suggest what you've offered as recommendations that would actually stop the disinformation from seeping in, given that we have an open and democratic society, given that we have social media, how, how do we actually uh, stop this? Other than, well, I'm just sort of curious. How, what are the what are the what are the tactics and the strategies we use to prevent this from really undermining uh, society here in the United States and really creating more divisiveness? I'm happy to jump in there. Uh, thank you, Congressman, for that question. You're absolutely right. There's there's not very much that we can do uh, to instantaneously correct this problem. Right now, and for the past four or five years, we've been playing what I call whack-a-troll, where we want to just focus on offensive content, harmful content. Um, but really, we need a much more systematic, um, in fact, endemic solution. And our adversaries, Russia, China, Iran, have been playing the long game. They're playing a generational game. Um, they're not necessarily interested in getting it right every time, but they know that if they can chip away uh, at the surface, eventually they're going to get to the, the core of the, uh, of the polarization that they're seeking for and keep us distracted so that they can do whatever it is that they're looking to do in their near abroads domestically with regard to human rights, et cetera, as well as achieve political goals. And um, so that's why in addition to, to focusing a little bit on content moderation, which is the topic du jour, right? In addition to making sure that our uh, our government bodies are putting out authoritative information that it is trusted by the public. That's why we really need to start investing in what I call citizens-based responses. So all of the countries that I've studied uh, in Central and Eastern Europe that have been dealing with Russian disinformation for much longer than we even recognized it existed have all, of course, looked at the kinetic side of things. Uh, they, they have good cyber defenses, but they also invest in their people. And I know that's out of the remit of the subcommittee, um, but it just speaks to what Mr. Gersel, Mr. Lin, 
uh, and Dr. Kirschbaum have all touched on that we need a whole of society response and we really need to get out of this siloed national security thinking, invest in libraries, invest in public media so that people have uh, trustworthy sources of information to go to and, and invest in awareness and civics so that folks understand their role in the democratic process because ultimately that's what disinformation is trying to undermine, people's participation. Look, I, I, uh, yeah, I appreciate that. I, I, and I certainly don't want to be argumentative. I read recently Ann Applebaum's *The Twilight of Democracy*, which is a frightening volume. Similar kinds of lines of communication. But what troubles me is I can certainly envision foreign adversaries starting to spread through social media and otherwise arguments that a presidential election, for instance, uh, was stolen from the American public, and despite uh, a, a lot of instant investigation, no evidence ever uh, emerges that such a thing happened. And yet uh, you can imagine potentially a third of the American public believing it uh, no matter. And that's really gets at the foundations of American democracy. I think I'd like to believe that wasn't possible, but frankly, I feel like I just lived through this nightmare. And so um, I, I, I appreciate your what you're saying and I don't disagree with you. I'm just really, really concerned that there may not be an answer. And I don't know that's the Department of Defense's job. I don't even know how they begin to do this. But having listened to all three of you, I just struggle with like, okay, so what, if anything, can we do here? Uh, and I apologize, I'm using up a lot of time. But if, if the other two witnesses uh, wanted to respond, I'd, I'd love to hear uh, your thoughts as well. I'd say starting with education of the armed forces uh, is a is a big step forward. Getting the, getting the people uh, who are uh, whose job it is to protect us and defend the Constitution, getting the, teaching them what it means to do that, getting them some real education, uh, that's a meaningful step forward. I'm not sure. I mean, I don't mean to disagree with you. I think that's a great suggestion. We couldn't even get members of the House of Representatives to defend the Constitution uh, this past November against a suggestion that an election was stolen with no evidence uh, that that's the case. I, I'm not sure. If we can't get the Congress to do it, I don't know how we'd get members of the United States military to do it. But I, uh, okay, I don't mean to be argumentative. I'm just frustrated, and I think probably all of you are uh, with where we find ourselves. Congressman Morelli, if I may add uh, to that, just um, I certainly share your frustration. I suspect probably everyone on both sides, of, metaphorically, of the witness table, so to speak, uh, feels that. Um, but. Uh, the, the Supreme Court has been very clear that Americans have a First Amendment right to receive foreign disinformation, no matter how outrageous it is. Um, some philosophers talk about the uh, paradox of tolerance, which is that a society that's very tolerant and open to lots of views also potentially has the seeds of its own destruction, of course, which because someone could criticize the very society. So you're right. Um, uh, I think the best analogy, just very quickly, is, is the cybersecurity one, which is I think cybersecurity experts will tell you that at the end of the day, we're probably never going to be able to completely eliminate cybersecurity attacks from a sophisticated foreign adversary. Instead, well, and we'll, we should certainly work on that, but instead what we need to do is limit their effectiveness and their scope. And I think it's the same thing with disinformation. We're not going to stop it where it starts overseas, but we can limit its effectiveness on our soil. I've well exceeded my time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your indulgences. And I'm, I'm glad you gave the gentleman an opportunity to answer, and I yield back. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Morelli. Uh, now I'd like to recognize uh, Mr. Moore for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman and Ranking Member. Uh, it's clear, and I, I think I want to just, the sentiment that was, was given a few minutes ago, just we can't even just keep this with respect to the De Department of Defense. Uh, cyberspace, this threat, is in every aspect of our lives from banking entertainment i mean across the board and so uh just to, to emphasize the importance of this we you know when we do think about our defense related work our legacy platforms our legacy weapons platforms they, they, they still they still serve a um a valuable deterrent but electronic warfare and cyber operations are central to the future fight uh i'll keep my questions geared towards that and making sure we can we can be thinking about the future. And so I'll start with a question to Mr. Gerstel. We've heard in this committee that the artificial intelligence capabilities of our adversaries are rapidly progressing to the point where um, it can only be combated with our own AI technologies. Can you just give us some perspective? Um, is the United States winning this AR? 
an information command would be something that we should explore. Mr. Fallon, this is uh, this is Joe Kirschbaum. So um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure a command is necessary. Um, it, it, the reason that your your question piqued my interest is I remember more than 10 years ago, before Cyber Command was stood up, I remember having a conversation with some of the Department of Defense, and someone, someone asked me, "Say, what what would be your 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 um, biggest surprise um, after we are eventually stand up this year Cyber Command? You know, however many years from now, I forget what they asked me, and I." My answer to them was um, my my number one surprise would be if it's still called U.S. Cyber Command, because of the the nature of you know what we're what we're talking about now. The information environment involves so much more, and cyber is a part of it. Uh, so pe people have argued for for in fact that maybe Cyber Command should be expanded. Uh, we're agnostic on that. We obviously don't have an op opinion on that, but those are the kind of things to think about. It's on the one hand too broad to be just one organization, um, but you've definitely got to make sure that everyone understands what that bread means and who's involved and get get them working the correct way. That's more important than establishing an organization. Thank you very much. Gentlemen's time's expired. Uh, Mr. Khan is recognized now for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all of the uh, panelists for your uh, testimony. Uh, many of you have spoken about the importance of the United States uh, maintaining our strategic advantage in AI uh, and in industries of the future. Uh, I wonder if any of the panelists have fall, fallen the, uh, have followed the bipartisan effort uh, that Senator Schumer, uh, Senator Young, Representative Gallagher, and I uh, have taken with the Okay, Peter. With the Endless Frontiers yeah, Act, uh, which would put a hundred billion dollars over five years in the National Science Foundation uh, and create a technology directorate uh, to make sure America is collaborating with the private sector to lead uh, in the industries of the future. Uh, a, a bipartisan bill that has uh, six Republican senators, a number of Republicans and Democrats on uh, in the House. And I wonder if any of the panelists have. Uh, comments about uh, the importance of that uh, legislation. Uh, Congressman, I would simply uh, uh, say that that is exactly the part of the effort that, our, that we talk about when we say we need a whole society effort. Uh, and the, the National Commission on Artificial Intelligence, to which we've made many allusions, uh, certainly underscored the need for a highly trained and skilled workforce and the legislation that you just described would be uh, a significant step in that direction. Um, the uh, Office of the Director of National Intelligence in its Global Trends 2040 report, uh, talking about what future scenarios look, would look like, uh, made great reference to the fact that it would be critically important for our country to have a really skilled workforce to be able to deal with the uh, challenges of the digital revolution. So anything we can do in that regard is clearly going to have uh, pay very significant dividends. That by itself isn't going to stop disinformation. No one suggests that it would, but it's part of the overall solution. Let me ask you this. I, I was reading, uh, uh, let me ask two different uh, questions. I've, I've read the report that Eric Schmidt and others have did on the National Science Foundation of Artificial Intelligence. I think one of the critical points in there is that right now the AI traditionally has uh, requires voluminous data. But uh, when you're a child and you're learning, let's say, the word dog, it's not like we t put give a child thousands of data points of pictures of dogs. They see a few dogs and they learn the word dog, uh, which suggests that the uh, human mind is far more complex and sophisticated than current AI. And there is work being done at MIT and other places to try to understand how the human mind actually comprehends with probabilistic modeling that would allow AI to operate without voluminous data. Could you speak to how much of a comparative advantage that would be uh, over China, given that China has a data advantage if we are able to have AI that doesn't require as much data? I'm not sure I have the expertise on that particular topic. I don't know if the other panelists do. 
I know I know enough about that to be dangerous. Um, so don't 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 please don't take my word as gospel. It, it is definitely worth uh, worth worth an inquiry. I would just point out that the Chinese are aware of this too, and and, and they also understand the importance of uh, uh, of understanding the the neurophysiology of the human brain. Uh, and and uh, so I, I think that to assume that we could go down that path and the Chinese wouldn't, uh, I think doesn't work. Um, it is true that the Chinese have many data advantages in some ways and in other places we have better data advantages. Um, but uh, to assume that the Chinese are, aren't, aren't aware of the, the importance of neurophysiology and so on in the human brain, I, I think is, is probably not correct. You know, I hope you've always have good insights, and I wasn't suggesting that so China was unaware, uh, though I do think the leading research is being done uh, in, in the U.S., but more that the data uh, advantage that China has is enormous if, uh, if we don't have alternative innovations. The, the final question I uh, have is, uh, I don't know if any of the panelists have studied what Finland has done. I was reading somewhere that they have this uh, extraordinary intervention at the age of... Uh, six uh, because the Russian disinformation campaign was a big problem there and that this digital literacy uh, campaign is presumably or at least from what I've read work uh, in in having a more informed citizenry that doesn't fall for disinformation. Uh, a, is that true? Are any of you familiar with the program in Finland and B, do you have any ideas of what uh, digital literacy would look like in the United States? I'm happy to take that one, Congressman. Uh, yes, absolutely, that is true. Uh, it was not only on Comedy Central with Samantha Bee, but there are many academic studies of this as well. Um, it, and the the program starts as early as five, actually, with uh, students getting exposure to what is an ad versus what is your Saturday morning cartoon. So um, really not just media literacy, but general informational awareness. And I would say the United States needs to go one step farther when we're talking about information literacy. We often think about this as something um, that we can fairly easily, even given our, our federal education system do in schools. But I would say we need to reach voting age adults as well. And how can we do that? I mentioned libraries before. Libraries maintain a very high level of trust across partisan divides in the United States. We have a lot of them. They are looking for their raison d'etre in the 21st century. And I think this is a great vehicle um, to deliver this sort of training. Um, in the Czech Republic, they have a similar program. I like to call this the peas in the mashed potatoes approach. Uh, they It's targeted at elderly people, teaching them how to use their cell phones or iPads to FaceTime their grandchildren, just basic computer skills, but they also sneak in some information literacy in there. And that, again, gets to the need to be creative with, with these sorts of approaches and think outside of, uh, outside of our normal education national security boxes. But the most important thing, um, not only having a, a nonpartisan messenger, but the the curriculum itself needs to be nonpartisan um, and make sure that we're giving the people tools that they, they need to support um, the information that they're trying to gather to make decisions at the ballot box, uh, to, to you know, make economic decisions, et cetera. It shouldn't be motivated by, by any partisan agenda. Well, thank you. I, I'd look forward to working with you and maybe in a bipartisan way. Uh, I think that would be a, a very worthy project for the Congress in a bipartisan way if we can design a form of digital literacy for students and adults. And uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I yield back my time. Thank you, Mr. Khanna. Uh, Ms. Bice is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this is really for any of the panelists. Um, you know, it's crucial for our nation to have our own robust off offensive information operations capabilities in place to influence adversary actions, deceive enemies, and to stay, try to stay ahead of the adversarial decision-making in times of war. What role do you feel uh, is proper for the military in this area? So, um, Ms. Bice, the, the Department of Defense really, it, it's, it's an, at a heart, it's hard, it's an operational military role. So for, at the operational level of war, um, the, you know, it's below the strategic level. That's primarily what, what we've been looking at, what we're talking about, how to, how to make sure that everyone at the combatant command level, the commander understands as he or she is working with partners in the, at the ambassador level or, or um, regional uh, allies and partners, understands what we are trying to achieve. 
and 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 to get that done. So those are those are campaigns that we talked about that are taking place below the threshold of armed conflict all the time. The military has a that's the that's a that's the primary thing that we are talking about here in terms of what the military's role is. Now that whole of government approach that bring it up a level strategy. Where does the where does the United States fit in with its allies and partners? That's a that's a much broader that whole of government whole of society. In in this case, the department should plug in to whatever efforts are being done and led out of places like the State Department or whatever organizations get created in the future. You know, during the Cold War, we had uh, the United States Information Agency that um, that organized a lot of these things, that, that or orchestrated large campaigns of for to support information for our allies, our partners, and beyond into the Iron Curtain, for example. That's a that's a huge undertaking that no longer exists. That's gone. It was it's been swept away, and, and we can't necessarily just recreate it, nor should we. But we think about how to do that, and the military would plug in to those efforts, uh, in addition to maintaining its own uh, battlefield capabilities. Great. Uh, that's all I have, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Very good. Um, is anybody uh, any member on that uh, hasn't been recognized yet that wants to be recognized? I think we've got everybody. Um, okay, uh, with that, I just want to thank our, our witnesses for uh, your testimony today. It's been very insightful uh, and very helpful to our work. Um, I know that uh, I had additional questions and uh, other members may have additional questions uh, that we'd like to submit for the record. If you could respond to those, uh, it'd be very helpful as well. So with that, um, again, thank you to our witnesses. Uh, deeply value your expertise and your contributions to this. Uh, important conversation and helping us to understand and get our arms around these challenges. Um, with that, uh, the hearing stands adjourned. Have a great weekend, everyone.